Exodus was the text for a preaching elective, and we had to memorize the scriptures. These are the names of the children of Israel coming to Egypt with Jacob. Each man and his household, they came. We took those texts and we let them read us in all sorts of ways and all sorts of places. It was in the evening under a grove of trees beside the seminary that one person said as she dug in the dirt and around the roots, I bury the grief I have carried because of the patriarchs who have silenced the voices of women. I grieve the impact of having been silenced, she said, but I celebrate this day that I have a voice. It was that evening that I publicly acknowledged my own hidden and unacknowledged grief. I carry some of that today. A memorized text about patriarchs brought me to confess the pain of having lost children to failed pregnancies there in that space that night. And in the morning, weeping lingers for the night, but joy comes in the morning. But in the morning, there was new freedom in that acknowledged grief. And there was a deeper understanding of God's provision. God provides the meal. We do the gathering. And there is enough. There was evening, then morning that first day, and that brings us to this day. So listen now to a word from the Lord from selected verses of Exodus chapter 16. The whole congregation of the Israelites set out from Elim, and Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they departed from Egypt. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and we ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill us from hunger. And then the Lord said to Moses, (laughs) I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you. And each day the people shall go out and they'll gather, gather enough for that day. And in that way, I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. Well, on the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it's going to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. And so Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening, you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning, you shall see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard your complaining and that you utter all against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us. It is against the Lord. And then Moses said to Aaron, say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked to the wilderness. And the glory of the Lord appeared in a cloud. And the Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them at twilight, you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. And in the evening, quails came up, and they covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew over the camp. And when the layer of dew lifted... 
There on the surface of the wilderness was a fine, flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. And when the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they didn't know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather as much of it as each of you needs, as an omer to a person, according to the number of persons, all providing for those in their own tents. The Israelites did so, some gathering more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, those who gathered much had nothing left over. And those who had gathered little had no shortage. They gathered as much as each of them needed. And Moses said to them, let no one leave any of it over until morning. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Georgiana and Louie showed up. They sat in the same pew, kind of where Mary is this morning, And sometimes they napped at the same schedule in worship. Sitting behind them, our family kind of learned the cadence of their breathing, the predictable tilt of their head. We saw the next generation put a gentle, steadying hand on a shoulder, maybe even having to miss a standing up and singing a few stanzas of a hymn. This sanctuary was home. Louis sat on a sawhorse in the middle aisle as a young boy as this sanctuary was being built and these nine vaulted arches were raised to rest on columns that are capped by stone corbels. Each corbel has a different carved symbol taken from church history. Georgiana was the same. Her family was part of the architect, was the architect. So her face and her brother's face are carved into the stone in the garth. Griff, he advocated for the importance of historical preservation of this space. And Jim, he stood in the center aisle like Louis had years before him, leading church tours and pointing out and, and telling the biblical story that each one of these corbels represents. The sanctuary is a home. Louis would stand at his window at Baker Donaldson. And he would relive the day that he watched the marching garbage striker turn toward town. And he would wonder aloud if his decisions had been the right and faithful ones. His faith gave him the courage to engage in the cause. Georgiana was one of the first female medical illustrators. She was an artist who could translate for physicians around the world the detail of the human body. She had learned about seeing detail and translating that knowledge in the church. And Griff and Jim knew something about this space. Griff about the necessary operations to maintain this place where God-sized dreams emerge And Jim, the necessity to use the imagination to tell the stories of faith behind and before the beauty in the sanctuary. God provides the meal, the manna, and quail, and God provides for us. And as we are fed, we come to know God and take courage to live in the wilderness of the world. Sometimes, All you have is a memory of home. Louise knew it too. 
She reached the point where being at church was an impossibility. Nearly housebound, the last time she crossed the threshold at Idlewild was into the chapel for a great-grandchild's baptism at an 8.30 service. At the 8.30 service, we always move forward to take from the loaf. But Fifi, as her family called her, couldn't move from the pew. Her fingers were too frail to pull that abundant piece of bread from the loaf. But she received the bread pulled for her as she heard, this is Christ's body broken for you, Louise, and the cup of joy. Fifi also told the stories of the church from the choir loft. She saw her boys in the balcony when they were young and she realized that they had brought the family kitten to church. (laughs) These were the same boys who befriended the children of the Cuban refugees that this church made a way for and made a home for in Memphis. God provides the meal and God provides for us. And as we're fed, We come to know God, and we take courage to live in the wilderness of the world. Sometimes all you have is a memory of home, and we've known that memory over the wilderness of this pandemic year. Sometimes all you can do is imagine, and we've had to do that a lot over this year. Meredith has her particular Spot, which is usually behind Ray and Sam and Louise. Sam usually sits with the Barbaras and his Kathy, and he always takes the peppermint wrapper back, lest you leave your trash in the pews or in your pocket. And on time, and you blew it for me this morning, Bruce, a few minutes after worship had begun. As the opening hymn was resounding, you could watch Bruce walk into this sanctuary and take his hand as he traced the wall, and he found the presence of the generations who had gone before sliding into that West penalty box. God provides the meal, and God provides for us. And as we're fed, we come to know God and take courage to live in the wilderness of the world. We're fed here at this table and in this house, this home. And we have to leave this place nourished by the meal that God gives to us. God provides the meal and God provides for us. And as we're fed, faith and courage, they grow in us. The meal, it is unending as unending as God's grace. And God's grace is sufficient, and it's made perfect in our weakness. In God's economy, there are no polite shenanigans. But instead, there are risky actions that we have to take that reveal God's love and justice. God's mercy and compassion. To do the things that need to be done in this world. Well, Pharaoh still lives in this world. But sometimes we have to come to the table, be fed, and we have to leave home. This home. The church is called to be the visible and witnessing community of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The essential structure of God's gathered people is to be an unfolding narrative, to be an unfolding story, another page to turn, rather than a rigid, institutional, operational structure. Louis, Georgiana, Griff, Jim, Louise, each and many others, they were courageous in the ways that they let us watch them 
age among us. They were God's witnesses in their faithfulness. And God, God stands with us as we carry a pride flag and we bear witness to a God who welcomes all. And God encourages us to show up and to make meaning in the beginning of life, through it all, and especially at the end. God pushes us to ask, where is it that we have silenced the truth? God feeds us with the word. What is it? It's truth, and it's enough. God's peace, God's presence, God's promise. To God be all glory, now and forever. Amen.